Yeah, thank you. So good evening, all of you. It really my pleasure to invite you all for this evening, the APA ICP postgraduate training program of this week. We have uh, two interesting cases for discussion from the endocrinology department. And the presentation is going to be done by Dr. Nishant Raj, the postgraduate from medicine department of PSG IMSR. And we have a case of uh, giddiness and evaluation to do with different disease. And another case of recurrent vomiting, working up, uh, work up uh, showed a different type of disease of endocrinological problem. To discuss this case, we have Dr. Bhargavi from Associate Professor of Department of Medicine from PSG. And we have Dr. Sendil Kumar, is a consultant in endocrinology from PSG IMSR. And Dr. Tyagarajan, also senior consultant in endocrinology from PSG IMSR. So over to the faculties to take over and postgraduate to present the case and discuss. Uh, thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. Uh, uh, shall we start now? Uh, yes, Dr. Nishant, you can start. Thank you. Uh, good evening to everyone. Uh, I am Dr. Nishant. Uh, so the first case I'm going to present uh, is a 38 years male uh, coming from Pollachi. Uh, daily wage laborer uh, presented to the ER with the complaints of uh, easy fatigability for the past four months, giddiness for four months, headache for the past 10 days, and episode of uh, giddiness followed by blackout on the day of admission. So, history of presenting illness, uh, history of easy fatigability was for the past four months. It was insidious and onset progressive, gradually involving the day-to-day -day activities. Uh, there was no any diurnal variation. Associated with the history of giddiness on and off for the past four uh, months, which was uh, described as a feeling of light headedness uh, or sometimes uh, unsteadiness. No history of any aggravating or... Uh, Nishant, uh, sorry, I'll just ask you a question there. Yes, you sir. mentioned the, the, there is no diurnal variation for uh, fatigability. Yes, sir. Can you, can you name a condition where you get diurnal variation for fatigability or sir, variation within the day? Sir, so, uh, any uh, a neuromuscular junction involvement like myasthenia gravis, where yeah, okay. uh, progressively as the day uh, goes on, the patient may feel uh, muscle. <coughs> yeah, yeah, okay. Yeah, yeah I can proceed. Yeah. Uh, GDNS it was not associated with any postural variation. Uh, complaints of uh, headache for the past 10 days, it was a diffuse, throbbing type of pain. Uh, there was no diurnal variation, no aggravating uh, factors, relieved on uh, analgesics. Uh, no history of any associated numbness of limbs, vision disturbances, nausea or vomiting. Uh, no history of any head injury. Uh, on the day of admission, patient uh, came to the ear with the history of giddiness, followed by a blackout or loss of consciousness lasting for around 10 seconds. Regained his consciousness spontaneously. It was not associated by any jerky limb movements or uprolling of eyes or tongue bite. Uh, no history of any associated increased sweating or nausea prior to the episode. No history of any post-episode confusion was present. Uh, other negative history, there was no history of any chest pain, palpitation, breathlessness, no history of any swelling of legs or decreased urine output. History of weight loss was given, but it was not quantifiable. The patient described as there was weight loss and there was the loosening of the garments were present. No history of any yellowish discoloration of eyes or urine, no history of any blackish discoloration of stools or bleeding from gums, no history of any joint pain, no history of any hot or cold intolerance. No history of any constipation, muscle cramps, or increased sweating. No history of any tinnitus, earache, or discharge from the ears. No history of any fever or skin rashes. So, uh, Nishant, uh, can you just go back to the history, the negative history last? What yes. is the relevance of this blackish discoloration of stools with this current uh, case presentation? Ma'am, any history of any uh, bleeding manifestations, uh, chronic. Uh, GA bed loss as uh, anemia can present as fatigue with uh, giddiness. No, but you have also mentioned about bleeding from gums. Why should the bleeding from gums cause significant giddiness? Uh, chronic history of any recurrent episodes, any mucosal bleed. Okay, okay. Carry on. And uh, you mentioned about history of giddiness, right? What about CNS symptoms, motor weakness, sensory symptoms? Uh, actually, there was no, I mentioned history of no any numbness or uh, 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 numbness of the limbs uh, or numbness over the body. Uh, there was no motor weakness as such in the history uh, given by the patient. Okay, doctor. Uh, 
ஹிஸ்டரி <laughs> Uh, person is he takes a mixed diet normal sleep pattern normal bowel and bladder habits he is married and has two children uh, no history of any loss of libido or uh, no uh, allergic history family see there was no uh, history of malignancy in any uh, family members so summarizing uh, it's a 38 year old male with no known comorbidities is no adverse social habits present with the complaints of uh, fatigability and giddiness for the four months and the headache for the past 10 days with the episode of uh, syncope uh, present to the year uh, dr nishad headache can you tell me more about the uh, headache history wise uh, sir it was a diffuse type of headache sir and is more like throbbing uh, and it uh, there was no uh, frequency was mentioning sir uh, it telling like it present it throughout the day and uh, with the medication it got resolved again after the intake of medication after a few hours the pain again restarted ஹிஸ்டரி வைஸ் விச் எலிசிட் to rule out sinister conditions or red flags in history pointing towards uh, you know something serious uh, sir uh, any uh, severe uh, headache uh, which is an acute onset and it is very progressive in severity uh, and uh, associated with any uh, nausea vomiting any blurring of vision may post an acute uh, ser- uh, cns causes sir like like a severe cerebral vascular accident mm, can you be more specific i'll, I'll uh, tell you the clue uh, if the patient says it's the worst headache the patient has ever had in his or uh, her life uh, subarachnoid hemorrhage is subarachnoid hemorrhage okay what if the patient says unilateral headache with uh, pain on the same side in the eyes what would you think of acute uh, eye pain along with unilateral headache uh you can think of sinusitis yeah anything else specifically uh, eye pain uh trigeminal neuralgia possible yeah glaucoma something which can happen what if they say um headache is there which is worse on combing the hair sir headache which is worse when the patient tries to comb the hair um i'll give you one more clue patient also complains of pain while eating or mastic mastication mm. trigeminal tenderness yeah no no not tri- yeah yeah you are almost there tell try it yeah. um jain cell arthritis yes okay, okay. scalp tenderness these are all some of the things because if you suspect jain cell arthritis then you have to even before you get your esr report you have to give you 60 mg of prednisone to save the vision and so on so certain things in headache you have to be aware of which will be useful for your exams as well as for your practice and another important thing when you suspect syn somebody comes with headache when how will you decide whether to go for a ct scan ct brain or not to exclude an syn sir uh, uh, subacute to chronic duration of headache with more like a dull aching type of pain uh, and uh, if the lesion is very large enough uh, it can cause to increased icd symptoms so it will be it will be vomiting uh, projectile vomiting uh, blurring of visions there can be uh, yeah plus if the another clue is if they complain of headache which is worse on waking up or worse while after coughing uh, then it suggests that there is raised 
intracranial pressure in addition to your nausea vomiting and <clears throat> visual disturbances yeah. these are all certain so headache wise your history is okay but you could be more elaborate to include each and everything okay okay sir yeah. and yeah, nishant you had mentioned about that uh, history of fever with polyarthralgia in childhood no any specific reason why you have included this history with these complaints uh, one differential diagnosis with the history of this can be any cardiac condition so possibility of any valvular heart disease so to look for any <laughs> but, but you have you had specifically mentioned that there was no history of any uh, heart failure uh, symptoms were not present here the presentation is more of fatigability giddiness yes taken syncope may happen but with this headache and fatigability uh, I, i i i thought you were trying to hit at something else when you mentioned about this rheumatic fever history um one for it was rheumatic fever another uh, uh, can be any autoimmune disorders like rheumatological conditions no rheumatological conditions like what like uh, uh, cervical spondylosis or ankylosing spondylosis but uh, there are no uh, other uh, history pertaining to that was not discussed right uh. mm, yes mm. i think i felt that could have been skipped for this case probably it would, well, if it was a serious case it would have been more relevant it didn't fit itself properly here carry on uh nishan yes uh, the syncope which he had what do you think what is it what, what kind of uh, why did he have syncope from the history uh sir uh, uh, he was recurrently having giddiness sir more like uh, <laughs> this uh, episode uh, can be due to um i uh, one possibility is like uh, severe anemia as one possibility sir uh, okay. second uh, what are the types of syncope you know and how will you differentiate in the history uh, sir uh, we have a uh, 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 vasovagal type of syncope sir good yeah uh, then we have uh, uh, syncope due to uh, uh, syncope due to cardiovascular condition sir then yeah. Uh, yeah, uh, neurological cause of syncope then uh, mm, uh autonomic neuro uh, like autonomic neuropathy autonomic disturbance causing syncope so. postural yeah. yeah so history wise what are the just tell me one one clue important points to clinch the uh, diagnosis with each history wise uh, vasovagal is more uh, like uh, emotional or any stress situation causing uh, uh, syncope uh, attack sir uh yeah. then the posture is mostly due to uh, variation of posture or resulting from uh, sit, uh, sitting to standing posture uh, resulting in giddiness sir with depression okay. or uh, work is morely related to cardiac syncope sir sorry uh, with the exertion or uh, strain yeah. leading to uh, syncope that is more like cardiovascular but cardiac syncope can also occur at rest isn't it i mean exertional syncope yes with aortic stenosis and things like that you can get if there is a radio reduction of but at rest yes. also you can get cardiac yes, syncope uh, associated palpitations like arrhythmias yeah. can uh, yeah, what is stokes body. adams syndrome sir stokes adams syndrome you have you heard of it ah uh, yes sir yeah sir uh, uh, it's a uh, arrhythmic condition sir where there is a sudden brief loss of consciousness uh, will yeah. be present sir yeah transient arrhythmia uh, mostly tachycardia is causing sudden brief uh, loss of consciousness then spontaneous recovery what are the classical features of neurological syncope uh, neurological uh, wise uh, uh, patient may uh, have associated any uh, uh, numbness of limbs or uh, uh, prior to uh, any uh, seizure episode Yeah, I mean, seizure is one of the I mean main reason for a neurological syncope, isn't it? I mean, it, uh, um, so 
what are the classical things in history you will i think you covered some of them when you presented uh, uh, mainly differentiating between a seizure and syncope uh, 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 usually the patient will have a, a post ictal confusional state in a seizure sir Uh, Let's start with that. before that. So before getting the syncope, what will they? Have? I mean, a seizure. What 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 will they have? Uh, they okay. patient can have a aura like before a yeah. initiation of yeah. a seizure episode. Yeah, so. yeah. Uh, then uh, during the episode, the patient may have this limb movements, uh, involuntary limb movements, uh, with a uh, uh, tonic uh, uh, contraction of the muscles. Tonic, tonic, uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, uh, or the patient can also have a frothing or tongue bite can also be yeah. a uh, marker, sir. And incontinence as well. Ah, uh, is a urinary or a bowel incontinence can also be present. Yeah, even with the vasovagal syncope, you can still have tonic-clonic movements. It is called anoxic uh, jerks. Still, they can have. Yeah. Uh, the only way you can differentiate between the two is after a seizure they will not recover immediately there will be a post ictal phase where they will be uh, there will be confusion okay yes sir so syncope you have to define loss of consciousness history wise and then see what is the prodromal symptoms how long they were who are the witness because the best way to elicit history from for a syncope is the next of i mean who, who was with the patient at that point uh, if not the history might be uh, incomplete okay Okay. okay. Good. Yeah, you can proceed. Good. Uh, so yeah, these are my differential diagnosis uh, following the history. Uh, one possibility is uh, anemia. Uh, second can be any metabolic cause like uh, dyserythrolytemia, like hyponatremia, or it can be cardiac causes like any uh, heart failure or valvular heart disease. or uh, it can be due to other uh, endocrine causes like uh, hypothyroidism or adrenal insufficiency and uh, last one can be any malignancy why hypothyroidism when the patient has weight loss mission uh, sir but the weight loss was not uh, quantifiable sir uh, okay. in uh, he was not able to show uh, tell clearly how much weight he has lost but okay. other symptoms like fatigue dizziness okay were there yeah. for a long time suggesting uh, to be one of the drug cases okay nishant did you mention about his personal history marital history whether about his libido was anything mentioned about it yes ma'am he is married and has two children and okay. uh, there was no history of any loss of libido ma'am okay i mentioned in the personal history. okay okay Shall I proceed, ma'am? Yes, please. Yeah. Yes, please. On uh, examination, um, <coughs> the patient was uh, in the examination in the ER. Patient is drowsy, uh, arousable. Uh, the Glasgow Coma uh, stage score was uh, E three, V five, and M six. Uh, the patient was moderately built and nourished. The BMI was around twenty two kg per meter square. Pallor was present. Uh, no ictus, cyanosis, clubbing, generalized lymphadenopathy, or pyrrhal edema. Dehydration was present. There was a uh, hoarseness, the quality of voice. Uh, there was no thyroid en- enlargement was uh, seen on the examination. No any hyperpigmentation of skin and mucous membrane. Uh, axillary pubic hair distribution was normal. Waist circumference was around ninety two centimeter. So vital signs. Uh, Heart rate was around one not three per minute. Regular in rhythm, normal volume, no abnormal character, no radio femoral or radio radial delay. Condition of vessel wall normal. All peripheral pulses were felt. Blood pressure uh, was under by seventy millimeter of mercury in left upper limb in supine position. Ninety by sixty millimeter of mercury in uh, left upper limb in the sitting position, and ninety by sixty in the left upper limb in the standing position. Uh, Where post there was no significant postural drop. Everything was checked after uh, three minutes of rest. Then uh, respiratory rate was around eighteen per minute. Abdominal thoracic type of respiration. Saturation was around ninety eight percentage in the room. Uh, jugular venous pulsations were not elevated. Temperature was ninety eight point two degree Fahrenheit. Coming on to the systemic examination, uh, cardiovascular system S one S two uh, sounds were present. There was no murmur. Uh, respiratory system, uh, all areas normal vesicular blood sounds were present. 
per abdomen there is uh, it was not soft not tender there was no organomegaly external genitalia penile was, was normal bilateral testes were palpable uh, per rectal the anal tone was normal fecal stain present uh, no internal hemorrhoids or mass was felt cns examination uh, the patient was drowsy the gc was e3 v5 m6 but he was oriented to time place and person the uh, memory was intact and no de uh, delusion or hallucination uh, cranial nerve examination done at that point uh, all, all optic and uh, three physic all cranial nerve examinations were normal uh, motor system examination were also normal the tone bulk and power were uh, uh, around normal for, uh, in all the both uh, right and uh, left upper and lower limbs um, deep tendon reflexes superficial tendon reflexes were uh, normal and present in both sides Now, there were no sensory or cerebellar signs were present and no signs of any meningeal irritation was present so post examination uh, my revised uh, differential diagnosis will still be anemia is one possibility and uh, metabolic disturbances hypothyroidism uh, adrenal insufficiency and uh, occult malignancy at the end of examination can you substantiate uh, this hypothyroidism uh i'm still uh, only the symptomatology was supportive of hypothyroidism there was no any goiter present in uh, uh, clinical examination or no is there any general examination showing uh, dryness of skin uh, another point was suggestive of is there was hoarseness of voice was present ma'am on examination but however you had mentioned that is deep tendon reflexes were normal including ankle jerk right yes ma'am and anything in your examination to support adrenal insufficiency uh, uh examination wise uh, na there was not nothing suggestive there was no postural drop in the bp there was no any hyperpigmentation of but there was hypotension right you mentioned that ah, yes, the, hypotension you mentioned the present. lower limb the lower limb bp was not mentioned but there was hypotension right it was 100 by 60 Yes, ma'am. There was hypotension, ma'am, but uh, on po there was no postural variation. Okay. Shall I proceed, sir? Ah, uh, yes, we can begin proceed. <coughs> so, on uh, investigation, uh, then the patient was admitted. So, on the complete uh, blood count examination, the hemoglobin was eleven point six and. Uh, MC was around seventy four point eight. Total count was around five thousand three hundred, and platelet count was two lakh forty two thousand. The uh, renal function test showed urea and creatinine to be normal. There was severe hyponatremia of one not four and potassium of three point zero nine. Ah, calcium ionized calcium was around point nine seven. LFT ah uh, liver function test were normal. Uh, so on workup of uh, sodium uh, hyponatremia the serum osmolality was reduced to 18 and the urine osmolality was 1143 and the urine uh, spot sodium was 8.82 uh, and the uh, arterial blood glass analysis was normal um, the ph of 7.44 uh, and po2 of 84 and bco2 of 34 bicarbonate was 23 and the uh, thyroid stimulation uh, stimulating arm tsh was around 16.06 which was increased and the ft4 uh, and ft3 levels were reduced and the random cortisol done at the point of admission was around uh, 44.29 uh, peripheral smear showed to have normocytic normochromic anemia with relative neutrophilia uh, the uric acid levels were low and magnesium and phos uh, magnesium levels were normal phosphorus levels were low Uh, urine complete uh, showed to have uh, uh, our, uh, sugars and ketones to be one plus. What about the blood sugar levels? Uh, Ma'am, uh, the RBS was around one sixty nine. You should have uh, mentioned that, no? Because we are, we are talking about hyponatremia and uh, symptoms. Then obviously, corrected sodium or whether there was any hyperglycemia should have been mentioned. And what was the relevance of uric acid in this case? Any particular correlation, ma'am? No. Why? Why was uric acid asked for, and what is the relevance of uric acid? Because so far we have not discussed it either in the differentials. Uh, ma'am, uh, the uh, see uh, both hypokalemia and hyponatremia was present uh, 
to rule out the, any other uh, ions have been lost uh, through the, the unit, any possibility of renal pathology, like any uh, uh, tubulo uh, losing, uh, salt losing uh, tubulopathies. Okay, proceed. <clears throat> Uh, then a patient was uh, admitted and appropriate uh, corrections were started. But following the next day, the patient suddenly developed the altered sensorium and disorientation and was shifted to ICU again. Uh, uh, Nisha, just a second. Whenever you find a patient with hyponatremia, what would be your next uh, step regarding physical examination? Uh, sir, uh, I, I want to assess the sensorium of the patient. Yeah, that you have told already in the <clears throat> general examination. You told he's a little bit drowsy, but very pertaining to hyponatremia, very specific to hyponatremia. Because you didn't know that he had low sodium earlier, but investigation showed low sodium. The next immediate uh, step, which will help you to direct further investigations. In other words, how will you classify? How will you fit them as what hyponatremia? Uh, dehydration, the hypovolemic hyponatremia, uvolemic or hypervolemic uh, hyponatremia. You have to assess the hydration, hydration status. Status. That is very important. Then only then you can you can find out what, what is causing this. Yeah, yeah, proceed. Sir? Uh, Nishant, just a second. How will you... Uh, Clinically, how will you differentiate hypovolemic, hyperolemic, and uvolemic? Sir, uh, based on the hydration status, the hypovolemic, the patient will be dehydrated. Like what? Sir, there can be clinical signs of uh, uh, dryness of the tongue, reduced skin turgor. Uh, skin turgor. The patient may have hypotension. Yeah. Uvolemic uh, state, the clinical, uh, the, the patient will be uh, there will not be any signs of dehydration. Sir, the blood pressure will be normal. And yeah. hyperolemic, yeah. there will be third spacing, like there can be pedal edema, uh, there yeah. can be a collection of uh, uh, fluids in the pleural space or peritoneal space. Yeah, so basically hyperolemia and hypolemia is easier to pick up. Uh, so if you it's, if they are not fitting into either of them, then it's probably you will be, okay? Yes, yeah. sir. Proceed. Yeah. Uh, so the patient developed altered sensorium and disorientation following the uh, day of admission. So and he was again shifted to the IMCU. And following which the early morning cortisol was taken, uh, which was found to be reduced of 0.198. Uh, following which uh, the patient was subject to other hormonal panels, like uh, the uh, other panels showed parathyroid hormone was normal. Uh, Luteinizing LH and FSH were normal, but the estradiol levels were low and testosterone levels were also low. Um, prolactin levels were increased uh, to 2000, uh, 2019. Uh, following which, again, the patient was uh, persistently had a uh, headache, and with this panel uh, showing the following findings, uh, subjected to MRI brain. So the MRI brain image showed the following uh, feature of. Uh, the pituitary glands were said to be uh, small uh, for the uh, that's not the pituitary gland. You have to come down the arrow yeah. here, more towards the left. Yeah, more, more. No, yes. down, down, down. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Then there's the bright spot which you see is the posterior yes. pituitary, and you see the optic chiasmus uh, up there. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah proceed. So it showed yeah. a small 4K of. In a type of flare intensities uh, with a bilateral, uh, with a restriction, the bilateral periventricular ma white matter and the uh, anterior pituitary appears to be small for age, likely hypoplastic was done. Following which, the MR angiogram was done, which was uh, normal and steady. So, so basically, uh, MRI shows a very thin rim of pituitary. Posterior pituitary is normal. Okay. Uh, okay. Uh, so, following which the patient was advised for ACTA suppression test and a bone mineral density scan. Uh, patient was not willing to for the same due to personal uh, reasons. So, the patient was discharged again medical advice, uh, but he was started on uh, uh, replacement therapies uh, for the deficient hormonal. Okay. One cortisol was uh, 40 or something. Why, why, 44. Why was the, 44. Uh, second was... Uh, what, yes, sir. What uh, at the uh, early morning cortisol was found to be 0.198, sir. 
Okay. Also, when the patient developed uh, uh, disorientation, it was checked again in the morning, sir. But is that uh, possible? Previous cortisol was normal. Isn't it? For, for why you, you, if you suspect adrenal insufficiency, that means the patient has developed an acute adrenal insufficiency in hospital. Is it the normal cortisol being what? down what what is your explanation for that because the fasting cortisol is low the random cortisol should be much more lower isn't it in the diurnal rhythm i uh, you know the highest cortisol concentration will be in the morning so did the patient receive any hydrocortisone is there a possibility is there, uh, there is a possibility received uh, steroid outside because he was initially gone to another hospital for the first aid purpose when he immediately had you know from there he was uh, referred to our hospital sir okay okay can you name a condition where you can get acute adrenal insufficiency in a cortisol just like if we go by this results uh, normal um, the day before and then suddenly the patient is taking a was a case turn and then the cortisol dropping down uh hello sir yes yes yeah can you name a couple of clinical conditions one or two or more or acute adrenal you want yeah acute adrenal insufficiency the patient has come with normal cortisol cortisol is 44 and then the next day the patient deteriorates and cortisol drops down mm, sir uh, any uh, uh, pituitary uh, uh, infarction sir sudden uh, Yeah, pituitary apoplexy. Even yeah. though it might be a little bit subclinical, can happen theoretically. Yes. Anything else? Mm. Sir, uh, post-pregnancy Sheehan syndrome. Sheehan will not be acute like this. It's mostly detected many years down the line after the delivery. Any primary adrenal insufficiency, Nishan? Yeah, you have to think in terms of primary. That's the clue from Dr. Tyagarajan. anything sudden usually is vascular isn't it so can you think of anything sudden happening especially in patients with sepsis or patients on oral anticoagulants nowadays you are using lot of this newer oa oral anticoagulants any problem with meningococcal infection sir meningococcal infections uh you've heard about septic emboli say yeah what Water house Fredrickson syndrome. And... Water, sir, I am not able to hear, sir. Adrenal hemorrhage in sepsis. Sir, adrenal hemorrhage due to uh, oral anticoagulants or due to sepsis can predispose them to acute adrenal insufficiency. Yes, okay. Are you able sir. to hear me? Yes, yes sir. Yes, sir. now I am able to hear. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, proceed. Yeah. Uh, can such pronounced uh, uh, decrease in cortisol usually doesn't happen? You know, even in those situations, you know, the cortisol will be a little bit higher, at least more than one microgram per deciliter. So less than one, you know, kind of points towards that the patient got some sort of steroids outside, and because of that, you know, he had an acute suppression, and that the and the the next day morning cortisol was such low, such low numbers. Yes. Uh, so, uh, so patient was discharged against the medical advice. Uh, so, a probable uh, diagnosis was made at the end of uh, discharge was uh, probable hypopituitarism. Uh, pituitary hypoplasia was made, and uh, patient was started on uh, replacement therapy. Uh, uh this is a general treatment which is not it was not given to the patient so general hormone replacement therapy which is given to patient with uh, diagnosis of hypopituitarism uh with hydrocortisone of 10 to 20 mg per day in a divided doses and thyroxine of uh, 0.075 to 0.15 mg daily uh, and uh, fsh lsh uh, testosterone nh3 200 mg im every two weeks uh, if growth hormone deficiency is present somatotrophin of uh, 0.20 to 1.25 mg subcutaneous qid uh, vasopressin intranasal desmopressin of 5 to 20 g twice daily can be given yeah vasopressin uh, dr nishan we don't uh, uh, replace routinely unless they have diabetes insipidus which is more common in kind of hypophysitis rather than hypopituitarism yes. and uh, growth hormone therapy again in adults even though you can give there are indications we 
you know due to a cost and other issues there's no uh, uh, real need to replace it yes sir anishant uh, you know can you um, um uh, you know substantiate you know how did you come to this diagnosis of uh, uh, hypopituitarism sir uh, it was not confirmed to be that it was a uh, problem because the patient uh, starting with the history of uh, uh, subacute to chronic onset of fatigue with uh, giddiness and the episode of syncope uh, followed by uh, uh, low uh, blood pressure or hypotension in the examination uh, and the investigations uh, showing uh, uh, hypothyroidism uh, and uh, low cortisol levels uh, with uh, Uh, hypogonadism was present uh, with the low testosterone levels hyperprolactinemia and uh, normal lh and fsh levels so uh, there can be high suspicion for uh, hypopituitarism sir and uh, patient also clinically responded to steroids after the treatment initiation uh, but the confirmation has to be uh, confirmed uh, asian test was not been able to do sir as uh, patient was not able to be subject to the acth stimulation test sir. and uh, so it can be a probable of i probability of having a hypopituitarism as diagnosis like other diagnosis differential which is kept uh, were not satisfied by the investigative findings sir. uh dr prishant if i say he is a hypopit uh, because of low sodium and response to steroids and pituitary was a little smaller in mri but if i say he has probably adrenal primary adrenal insufficiency which can also cause hyponatremia how will you argue or in other words how will you differentiate between primary and secondary adrenal insufficiency based on clinical and biochemical parameters sir uh, clinical wise uh, the primary adrenal insufficiency the age of onset will be mostly from childhood to adolescence will be the point of uh, thing sir and the second thing uh, the primary adrenal insufficiency uh, will can have uh, more like uh, 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 severe hyponatremia with uh, um, was the potassium levels will be increased sir okay yeah uh, but the secondary adrenal insufficiency there need not be any uh, 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 hyperkalemia is needed sir and uh, they uh, why so hyperkalemia will be there in primary adrenal insufficiency sir why hyperkalemia will be there in primary adrenal insufficiency uh sir so that is uh, in a primary adrenal insufficiency hello no, yes 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 good yes good yes, 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 yes. occurs due to decrease in the aldosterone levels sir Yeah, cortisol as well as aldosterone is affected. Uh, anything else would change, so potassium will go up. Anything else will go up uh, with primary adrenal insufficiency apart from potassium. So you'll get hyperkalemia, hyponatremia. Anything else? So you'll also have an element of uh, metabolic acidosis because hydrogen ion also will not be excreted. That also will be retained. Okay. Yes, sir. Uh, secondary. adrenal insufficiency aldosterone will not be affected I because see. it is in the problem is in the pituitary then how do they get hyponatremia sir uh, so aldosterone is there why should they get hyponatremia in secondary adrenal insufficiency like this patient sir uh, uh, though the aldosterone levels are uh, normal uh, 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 there can be increase in the adh levels and sometimes yeah good yeah how does increase in adh happen with uh, secondary adrenal insufficiency good uh, sir uh, there can be uh, uh, so uh, basically in other words um, you know with uh, adrenal uh, secondary adrenal insufficiency or primary you get the hypotension isn't it you told uh, the patient had hypotension yes sir why cortisol deficiency causes hypotension sir uh, uh, cortisol is a uh, as a vasodilatory effect sir so cortisol deficiency why does it cause hypotension 
Hello. It is deficient cortisol, isn't it? So it is causing hypotension. Why is it causing hypotension? The answer lies in that for your well, because uh, you deficiency know, will uh, usually uh, will uh, decrease the vascular tone, sir. Yeah, the why is so, the reason is I'll tell you. The, uh, you know the catecholamines uh, causes yeah. vasoconstriction. Isn't it? They maintain the blood pressure, <laughs> so they need cortisol for the responsiveness. So the vascular responsiveness depends on the presence of cortisol. So the vascular responsiveness of the catecholamines. So when you have no cortisol or low cortisol, the vascular responsiveness for the catecholamines is decreased. So they develop hypotension. When you develop hypotension, your extracellular fluid volume goes down, which will stimulate your ADH. Okay. Yes, sir. Yeah, got it. Yeah. Clinical examination okay. wise, any clues to differentiate yeah. between primary and second insufficiency? Um, uh, primary, there can be uh, uh, hyperpigmentation of uh, uh, skin um, and mucous membrane. Yes, this is due to what? This hyperpigmentation? Uh, this due to melanocortin uh, excess production. Um. Co stimulation of melanocytes. Yes, ma'am. Any other change in the electrolytes and hematological change, you can expect that in insufficiency. Uh, sir, uh, there can be uh, uh, anemia can be present, sir. There can be normocytic anemia. Any change in the white cell milieu? Sir? White cell lineage. Any change in the white cell lineage, WBC? Uh, there can be, uh, depends on the car, there can be increase in the uh, lymphocytes level, sir. No. Mm -hmm. That can be associated with eosinophilia also. Yeah. Yeah. Eosinophilia can go up with other insufficiency. And uh, electrolytes, which you can get hypercalcemia also. You can get hypercalcemia also. So, few changes you can expect. But whatever they discussed is the common one. The other can the other things which I discussed is can be associated with. Right. Yes, sir. So I have a basic question to you, Nishant. You have been presenting your findings of the patient, and after the end of your examination, also you felt the patient is a bit drowsy with low GCS. You still you voted in favor of anemia is one of the important differentials for this clinical presentation. So, what could be the reason why you still stick on? Is it a common to have anemia to produce low GCS? Uh, no, sir. Because initially you said exam history wise you thought of anemia, and you put your differentials. After which also you stick on to your differentials. The priority wise you stick on to anemia is one of the important differentials. The first in order. Just so wondering about is it a common thing to have disoriented behavior? Or uh, low GCS is an anemic patient. Uh, Assuming yeah. this patient is anemic, having low GCS, what are the possibilities you can think about? Or disoriented behavior, what are the things you can think about? Uh, shock, sir. Patient is going for a... No, anemia producing shock is not a common phenomenon. It's not a common phenomenon. Hmm. Uh, Mostly in this case, uh, you say acute hemorrhagic loss, blood loss leading on to shock. That's the meaning of your statement. Yes, any ongoing loss. Okay, okay, because chronic anemia never produces shock. Yes, it's always acute worsening might happen, or acute loss can lead on to shock. Okay, hmm. uh, assuming this patient is definitely having anemia. Okay. Yes, and sir. patients having low GCS try to relate and come out with few differentials. Uh, Think about different causes of anemia which can lead on to disoriented behavior. Keeping in mind the important uh, factors required to maintain the sensorium of the or brain function intact. Uh, which are the vitamins required which also can lead on to uh, deficiency uh, and lead on to anemia and this brain dysfunction. There are B12 deficiency and folic acid deficiencies can uh, can produce disoriented behavior. Mm. More common than that. 
uh, thiamine deficiency can produce thiamine deficiency then anything else mm. so what are the diseases you might come across with patient looks a bit pale at the same time disoriented behavior the common two differentials you'll be thinking about mm. hmm? sir, what are the types of beriberi you know so wet beriberi and dry beriberi sir so among the dry beriberi what are the problems you might come across related to brain sir na uh, it can wet so dry beriberi is known as case, vernicase vernicase coroscopy and coroscopy psychosis can be there the so yes. patient can be looking bit pale will be having skin changes it can have <coughs> neurological symptoms also yes. so when you're going to have a patient with anemia of the disoriented behavior you have to think about that probably need to ask for alcohol history also that's very one of the important common history and along with look for skin changes then go for immediately fundus examination then try to find out are we dealing with any features of increased icd then you make a impression of am i dealing with vertices versus coscos psychosis very important skin changes also will lead on to or will give a lead to the diagnosis of suspected the b1 and the common other vitamins like b6 and b12 also right yes. so i was wondering about you didn't discuss much about i thought just take up this point okay. over to sindil and tyagarajan uh, and bargain please Uh, and uh, just a continuity question in continuity to what sandil sir asked anything else differs in the treatment wise uh, treatment part of primary adrenal insufficiency and secondary insufficiency uh ma'am i didn't get no uh, no any other uh, distinct features in the treatment aspect of primary adrenal insufficiency and secondary adrenal insufficiency or central sorry primary and central insufficiencies ma'am uh, what about mineralocorticoid replacement ah uh, primary adrenal insufficiency the aldosterone uh, like uh, mineralocorticoid also should be supplemented ma'am yes ma'am yes sir prishad go ahead yeah Uh, sorry then uh, in uh, secondary uh, adrenal insufficiency uh, we mainly replace the hormones uh, which are going to be uh, uh, deficit ma'am yeah, so in central or uh, uh, central insufficiency uh, mineralocorticoid replacement is usually not necessary correct sir in... yes that's right ma'am yeah. yeah yes yes uh nishan uh, so you uh, diagnose this patient uh, and uh, the patient goes home on uh, hydrocortisone and uh, thyroxine uh, what is the most important uh, advice you will give this patient he is going to come back and see you after say 3 months or 6 months for follow up in your medicine opd but what is the most important piece of advice you will uh, tell the patient uh the patient uh, uh, steroid long term use can cause uh, 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 side effects and so steroid side should be mentioned like weight gain uh, increase in the blood glucose level can be a possibility should be explained to the patient sir mm, but he so needs long term steroids isn't it sir he, he needs long term steroids and if you tell i mean the team that might Uh, uh, discourage him from continuing it, isn't it? He needs long-term steroids. He's steroid deficient. You have said his life with steroids, so he is going home now. He's going to come back after three months. Uh, any instruction pertaining to steroid therapy? You tell the patient life-saving instructions. Suppose the patient gets a fever episode in between. Uh, um, immunosuppression can possibility should be. um no 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 um, have you heard of sick day rules sir uh, sick, sick sick day rules sick day rules for steroid therapy uh, so sir uh, 
Usually, what will so, patients do? Uh, mm. Sir? No, yeah. Normally, they have an yeah. Yeah, yes, sir, yes, yes. Um, so normally in a person, so for you and me, when we get a fever or any illness, what will happen to our endogenous steroid production? Uh, stress situation, it will increase. Increase, isn't it? So this patient, he hasn't got any steroids on board. So we are giving it from outside. So if he gets an infection like fever or if he undergoes any surgery or anything, any stressful event to, to him physically, uh, so his body will not produce steroids. So what should we do during that time? You have to increase the dose of yeah. Double the dose of steroids. Suppose if he's not able to eat and drink uh, due to diarrhea, vomiting or any other reason, we should substitute this steroid as an injection of hydrocortisone until he recovers. Okay. Yes, sir. Um, this is called sick day rules and it's very important because you have saved the life of the patient and then he goes home and stops the steroids, then uh, everything would be a waste. So you have to give a written information to the patient so that whenever wherever he goes, if he becomes ill, he can show it show the letter to the treating doctor so he knows that he's on long-term steroids and he can give parenteral steroids during times of illness. Okay. Okay. Yes, Shall I proceed to the next case, sir? Yeah, if every others are okay, then we can go there. Yes, sir. Chagrajan, uh, yes, sir. Yeah. I think yeah. we can go ahead. Yeah. 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 Next case, uh, it's a 50 year female homemaker coming from Coimbatore, presented with the complaints of vomiting <coughs> on and off for the past one year, complaints of palpitation for the past four months, history of presenting illness. History of vomiting on and off for one year, insidious onset occurs in the early morning after waking up from sleep. Non projectile, non bilious, not blood stain. Content was mostly food particles. Frequency was around two to four episodes per week initially. Uh, the patient could only tell approximate uh, episodes of frequency, but it has been increased since past uh, four months. Uh, history of palpitation for the past four months, uh, insidious and onset, no aggravating or renewing factors. Episodic in nature, the patient was not able to describe the frequency of occurrence of the palpitation, uh, not associated with any increased sweating, history of any uh, headache for the past. Uh, Dr. Nishan, palpitation, your history should be more elaborate. One important thing is missing there, what it is? Sir, any, uh, I anybody, you sir. have to, one important thing which you have to ask when they say palpitation. So you told the associated factors, but one very important point. You can, uh, you have to ask the patient whether the palpitations, you know, you can even, uh, you know, according to textbook, you can ask them to even tap on the yes. table and say whether it is regular or irregular. What are the causes for regular palpitations? Sir, uh, sinus. What are uh, the causes for irregularly irregular palpitations? Uh, regular can be uh, sinus, tachycardia, exertion. Okay. Uh, Anything uh, else? Any mm -hmm. supraventricular tachycardia can be regular, yes. isn't it? Yeah, regular. regular. And I even ventricular tachycardia, you never know. It's, I'm not talking about pulseless VT, but ventricular tachycardia also, it can be regular. Irregular uh, palpitations, what are the causes? Uh, atrial fibrillation, flutter, yeah. atrial ventricular block with... Uh, atrial flutter with variable block, you have to be yes. specific. Hmm? Yes. Um, and then any extra systole is also, they can feel that way. So you have to ask whether it was fast or slow and then regular or irregular and you have to ask the demonstrate ask the patient to demonstrate if possible then it gives you a lot of clues into palpitations and then your associated factors like exertion uh, episodic sweating uh, chest pain is also important because it could be a ischemic thing also isn't it yes sir uh, um, so all those things are important hmm? also associated so by this itself we can distinguish yeah yeah, yeah, please. Proceed. And also associated with any presyncopal symptoms as well. No, yes, ma'am. Uh, yes. I mentioned the negative history, ma'am. Okay, okay. Continue. Uh, history of headache for the past four months. Uh, it was a diffuse aching type of headache. Uh, no aggravating or relieving factors. No associated uh, visual disturbance or numbness of the body. No uh, history of weight loss around 2 kgs in 3 months. Uh, history of uh, loss of appetite uh, for the past four months. Uh, no history of any abdominal pain, loose tools. No history of any early satiety or bloating sensation. No history of any chest pain, breathlessness, syncope, swelling of both legs. 
no history of any weakness of limb, no history of any burning maturation, facial puffiness or decreased urine output, no history of any fever. Uh, coming on to the past history, uh, in the known history of uh, uh, systemic hypertension for the past one day, the patient is on tablet prezosin, uh, extended release 25 mg BD and uh, history of diabetes mellitus for the one year with the tablet metformin 500 mg uh, BD. Is it 25 or 2.3? It should be 2.5. Sorry, 2.3. Yes. Uh, typing here, 2.5. Okay. So, uh, not a known case of uh, coronary artery disease, uh, bronchial asthma, thyroid disorder, uh, no past surgical history, uh, Personal history, uh, the patient takes a mixed diet, no adverse social habits, normal sleep pattern, normal bowel uh, and uh, bladder habits. Uh, uh, menstrual history, she attained menopause uh, two years ago. Uh, no known uh, allergic history, no significant family history. Uh, summarizing, uh, 50 year old female, known case of diabetes, mental and systemic hypertension with no adverse social habits. Present with the complaints of uh, vomiting uh, on the for the one year with headache and palpitation, with loss of weight for the past four months and loss of weight around uh, two kgs in the past three months. So the probable differential diagnosis uh, after history, uh, there is local causes, starting with GA causes like uh, gastroesophageal reflux disease, peptic ulcer disease, or uh, gastroparesis, which can be diabetic related, or uh, autonomic uh, autoimmune disorders uh, like uh, SLD, endocrine causes like uh, hyperthyroidism, adrenal insufficiency, and uh, possibility of uh, fear promocytoma or uh, chronic infections like uh, HIV. Um, when do you get headache when gastrointestinal causes? Nishan, will you get there? And... Uh, no, sir, but uh, uh, predominant vomiting and uh, this causes other local causes can be substantiated to gastroesophageal reflex, sir. Uh, and uh, you didn't in include any CNS causes because headache and vomiting, you know, first thing chronically there, you point towards uh, SOL or any neurological reasons. Sir. And no uh, serious causes also. Yes, hmm. uh, ma'am. Malignancy was uh, possibly, malignancy is a possibility, ma'am. And then hyperthyroidism usually, how is the appetite? Uh, there you is increased uh, in appetite. Increase in appetite, but loss of weight. No, that Basically. is a usual picture in hypothyroidism. And why SLD? She is a postmenopausal female. And anything else was there in history to suggest SLD? No, no. Uh, no so far, we had only you had only mentioned about headache, palpitations. Loss of appetite, loss of weight, correct? What here with Cecily? No, ma, gee, uh, uh, autoimmune disorders can have this vague uh, uh, systemic manifestations involving palpitations and uh, uh, gastrointestinal disturbances is a possibility. No, no, which autoimmune disorder will have gastrointestinal uh, uh, like, disturbances? Uh, uh, systemic sclerosis or... Uh, uh, systemic sclerosis taken, but SLE in this postmenopausal female sounds very unusual. Okay. Why are you thinking in terms of few chromocytoma, Nisha? Sir, uh, patient gives a new onset uh, hypertension history for the past one year associated with uh, uh, chronic episodes of uh, headache and palpitation. Okay. What is the uh, classical triad uh, symptom wise for pheochromocytoma to suspect? Classical uh, triad. Headache, uh, palpitation, and increased sweating. Yeah. So, if you have all these three in someone who has hypertension, the specificity for diagnosing is around 94 to 96%. Um, okay. Yeah, proceed. Yeah. Yes. And you had mentioned that uh, she was on prezos, you know, but what is the probability somebody will uh, start uh, hypertensive on prezosin? Is it a common practice to start directly on prezosin? 
Uh, no, ma'am. Uh, ideally, any new onset uh, hypertension, we can start it on our own uh, AC inhibitors or uh, calcium channel blockers, the initial. Okay, Chris. But the patient was already on medications when. Uh, um, yeah. I mean, um, Richard, this patient was on calcium channel blocker, amlodipine. Um, uh, uh, you know, the process, you know, started after the diagnosis changed over. Okay. Okay, sir. Okay. So, so on examination, the patient was conscious, uh, oriented to time, place and person. Uh, she was moderately built and nourished. BMI came around 23 kg per meter square. Uh, no pallor, ictus, sinosis, clubbing, generalized lymphadenopathy or edema. No thyroid enlargement, no hyperpigmentation of skin, no uh, axillary and pubic hair distribution was normal. Uh, breast examination was normal. Uh, vital examination, BP was around 170 by 100 millimeter of mercury measured in la left arm in sitting position. Uh, 160 by 100 uh, millimeter of mercury in left arm in standing position. Pulse rate was around 106 per minute, regular in rhythm. Normal volume, no abnormal character, no radio radial or radio femoral delay. Condition of vessel walls were normal and all peripheral pulses were felt. Respirate rate was around 16 per minute. Uh, it was a thoraco abdominal type of respiration. Uh, coming on to gastrointestinal system examination, oral cavity, uh, there was no halitosis. Dentures were normal, no ulcers in the oral cavity. Posterior pharyngeal wall was normal. Per abdomen examination, uh, inspection, shape was flat, all quadrants moved. With respiration, umbilicus and midline, no scars, sinuses, or dilated veins, hernial orifices were free, external genitalia normal. Uh, palpation wise, there was no warmth, no tenderness, abnormal girth was around 87 centimeter. Uh, the umbilicus midline is confirmed with the measurements. There was no organomegaly. Uh, percussion, there was no shifting dullness, liver span was normal, 11 centimeter. Uh, auscultation wise, uh, there was no bo uh, normal bowel sound error. There was no renal brewery. Per rectal, there was no skin tax, hemorrhoids, or no palpable mass felt. Um, other system examination, uh, S1, uh, S2 was present, no murmur, and uh, respiratory system, normal vesicular breath sounds are present in all areas. Uh, central nervous system, there was no focal neurological deficit. Yeah, yes, go ahead. Yeah. Uh, so, fundus, you didn't uh, see, Nishal? Sir? Fundus? Uh, yes, a CNS fundus examination was checked. It was normal, sir. Yeah, you should always mention it, okay, because that will help you to distinguish whether if we're talking about primary or secondary hypertension and also the duration of hypertension and severity, okay? Yes, sir. Okay. So, after examination, uh, uh, I couldn't uh, delete, but uh, uh, the possibility of endocrine uh, causes are to be uh, first followed by the, the J causes. And uh, still the possibility of a chronic infections are present. Yeah. Can you get hypotension in pheochromocytes? Hypo. Sir? You were talking about hypertension. Why is still positive? Hypotension in pheochromocytoma. Can can hypotension be a presenting feature in few? Uh, sir, uh, if there is, uh, sir, it is a possibility, sir. Yeah. Then which uh, type of few? So if the uh, lesion is very large and it's secreting large quantities of both catechol. I mean, so there can be intermittent secretion of this uh, catecholamines can cause uh, uh, hypotension. Sir. No, predominantly dopamine secreting tumors can present with hypotension. Okay, dopamine secreting. Okay. If okay. anything links the chronic infections you have mentioned in hypertension. No. No, anything links the chronic infections that you have mentioned yes. and hypertension. Uh, HIV. Does HIV per se cause hypertension, hypertension. or is it associated with? Uh, yes. 
No, I mean, HIV doesn't directly cause. Yes, yes, come again. No, HIV doesn't directly cause hypertension. No? Okay, then, but because at the end of examination, why you mentioned that still chronic infections is a possibility, right? So, anything in the clue? Um, uh, chronic uh, GI symptoms, uh, there was no any external lymphadenopathy or yes. uh, weight loss and uh, uh, chronic GI symptoms still is a possibility for uh, retroviral. What about hepatitis B? Anything specifically associated with hepatitis B can be causative of hypertension? Any vasculitis? Uh, Yes, ma'am. Uh, 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 ma'am, uh, hepatitis B can cause uh, um, like uh, polyarthritis, uh, ma'am. No, uh, sorry. Hepatitis B can be associated with it pan. That can uh, be a cause for hypertension. Yeah. So on investigation, uh, uh, hemoglobin was around 10.4, uh, total count was around uh, 11,000 uh, and uh, neutrophils were around 72, uh, lymphocyte 15.7 with monocyte 6.7 and uh, eosinophil 2.7, platelet was around 3,57,000, hemoglobin <coughs> was around 31.3. Uh, renal function test, urea was around uh, 19 and creatinine was normal. Electrolytes were uh, normal. LFT was normal and uh, serum cortisol morning was normal. Uh, FS, uh, TSH and FT4 were normal and uh, RBS was around uh, uh, 179 and HbA1c was around 6. Uh, urine analysis uh, was normal. Uh, patient was uh, subjected for uh, abdominal CT. Uh, we showed the following uh, lesion, uh, which is more clear in this picture, showing a right adrenal mass. Uh, so this right adrenal mass was around uh, 4.6 cross 4.4.5 centimeters on the right adrenal region, abetting the liver in the sucrolateral, where the vasculatory was arising from the adrenal branch of the renal artery. Um, patient was then uh, admitted and the blood pressure was uh, controlled. Uh, it's typing error of plus in 2.5. Uh, Nishant, uh, before that, you know, you found an adrenal mass. Um, so, what would be then the patient has got hypertension? What would be the next uh, investigation, which I think you have not included probably? So you would have found an adrenal mass and the patient has hypertension, palpitations and all. So what other investigation we would have done? It has been done in this patient. Sir, uh, uh, urinary uh, metanephrines. Yeah. So have you included that? Sir, uh, yes, sir. the report was not uh, available, sir. For you to include, okay. It was, it was done. Uh, you know, so even before the CT, it was done. And why we should do biochemical investigation before we do the imaging. So if you are suspecting pheochromocytoma, we will do a 24 hours. What, what investigation you will do as a screening test? A 24 hours urinary uh, metanephrines is considered. Metanephrines or normetanephrines or both? Uh, metanephrines only done, sir. 24 hours urinary but on plasma metanephrine, it can also be tested. Sir. Yeah. Will you not do normetanephrines? Sir, uh, normetanephrines can also be done, sir. Uh, but usually we do is... Uh, um, so in some uh, patients, you will get uh, elevated normetanephrine, but normal metanephrine. Still, it could be few. So you have to do both. Yes. Um, can you explain the reason for this? Because this patient had that peculiarity. That's why I'm asking that question. I think you missed that urinary report. Okay. Um, so normally, uh, noradrenaline to adrenaline conversion uh, happens through an enzyme called 
PNMT, phenyl ethanolamine and methyl transferase. Okay. Yes, sir. So this enzyme converts noradrenaline to adrenaline. And yes. this uh, conversion is dependent on availability of cortisol. Okay. Yes. Uh, so any tumor which is arising from the adrenal uh, region uh, will have more of adrenaline so or epinephrine. So you will have norepinephrine more in the blood. Norepinephrine is nothing but a stable metabolite of epinephrine. Yes. So if the tumors are extra adrenal, cortisol will be less. So this conversion will not take place. So you will have more of noradrenaline releasing from the tumor. So normetanephrine. Okay. Okay. Again, in very big tumors, this, uh, uh, you know, the PNMT uh, will not uh, be very effective because the cortisol levels will be low. So again, you'll get more of noradrenaline or normetanephrine. Okay. Uh, so, okay. uh, uh, so whenever you are suspecting pheochromocytoma, yeah, uh, I mean, VMA we are not doing, but you can go for plasma or urinary metanephrines, but uh, go for both 24 hours urinary and normetanephrines and metanephrines. Okay. Yes, sir. Uh, why which we should do biochemical investigation before going for the imaging? Uh, sir, uh, in a, uh, uh, imaging may require a contrast, sir. Yeah, that is one thing. Why? What's wrong with contrast? Uh, since we are taking the excretion of the contrast can interfere with the reports. Mm, no, no, not really. The reason why we do uh, biochemical investigation always in endocrinology before imaging is you'll end up finding incidental adrenal nodules and stuff like that for which you will not be having an explanation. So that's the reason we do biochemically followed by uh, CT scan. Okay. Yes. Uh, but one thing specific to this case is, as you said, contrast has a small risk of precipitating pheocrisis. Hmm? Yes, sir. Okay. What are the factors which precipitates pheocrisis? Uh, sir, uh, you are suspecting PHEO in a patient. Uh, before you come to the diagnosis and treatment, what are the things we should be careful of about? Sir, uh, uh, sir any uh, drug intake? Yeah. Like? Uh, sir? Uh, like? Which medicine, sir? Yeah. yeah. Sir, any withdrawal from uh, uh, antihepatins like clonidin or any uh, sympathomimetic drugs like uh, uh, drug abuse? No, there are drugs which can precipitate fear crisis like the tricyclic antidepressants, semio inhibitors, and all those things. We, and anesthesia, IV contrast is one among them. Yes, so, sir. all this you have to be careful. Or any strain or a deep palpation of the abdomen also can precipitate crisis. Yes, um, and what any other antihypertensive drug, you'll be careful. If you're suspecting FIO, you should refrain from giving one antihypertensive drug if, until you clear FIO of the diagnosis. What drug do you avoid? Uh, is there a... So patient has come with hypertension. You're suspecting FIO. That particular drug you should not give until you have excluded for you. Mm. If you give that drug, the patient can go in for crisis. The centrally acting uh, uh, beta blockers uh, open or not? Yeah, beta blockers. Yeah, any beta blockers. Why? Uh, sir, uh, they can. Uh, uh, Sir, uh, they can cause yeah. uh, uh, blockade of the beta receptors may mediate vaso uh, uh, like uh, there will be under function alpha cause uh, hypertensive crisis or pulmonary yeah. Yeah. because there will be under post alpha action isn't it so you have alpha block and then beta block so you should not use beta blockers if you are suspecting few okay yeah proceed Sir, uh, then the patient was uh, admitted and the blood pressure was controlled. Uh, then uh, following obtaining anesthesia fitness, uh, adrenalectomy was done. So the biopsy showed uh, well-capsulated. Uh, Nishant, uh, yeah. uh, how will you prepare the patient for uh, your return? 
prazosin is uh, alpha blockade you have started and then after that what will be a start so and after sir. yeah and hypertensis yeah you cannot subject a patient to surgery with just alpha blockade and uh, ac inhibitor alone sir we can go for uh, calcium channel blockers before that uh, beta blockers like lebetalol yeah beta blockers so this patient was started on alpha blockade right right and then started on beta blockade then had calcium channel blocker and then primaprin this was the sequence uh, which happened in this patient okay so you have to adequately alpha block and then 72 hours after you have started alpha block minimum then you have to introduce beta blockade uh, to control the pulse rate and and then on top of that when you have attained maximum dose of both you can consider see calcium channel blocker or as and then subject them to surgery the bp systolic bp should be around only 110 or uh, not more than 120 when you are handing over to the surgeons okay yes sir otherwise they will go in for uh, intraoperative they can go for a crisis sir yeah how how to manage it sir uh, you can go for a or like uh, sodium nitroprusate can be used sir yeah you have to have uh, iv lebetalol or esmolol they can go in for arrhythmias so all these things will happen okay yes. Yeah. Okay. Proceed. So uh, you showed a well encapsulated neoplasm arranged in well balanced uh, pattern. So diagnosed a confirmation as pheochromocytoma of right adrenal uh, gland, which was moderately differentiated. And uh, the patient uh, post-operative period was uneventful, and the uh, patient was discharged on PO D four. Okay. Suppose this patient is twenty uh, year old. or 25 i mean sure. in the second decade or third decade yes, uh, what are the other things you should think of sir uh, other uh, secondary hypertension causes to be no no pertaining to pheo associations of pheochromocytoma sir is asking mm. this patient is post menopausal but if this patient was 20 in, in the 20s or 30s Younger patient uh, when that has been diagnosed with pheo. What are the other associations or conditions you should be looking out for? Uh, sir, uh, we can look for any men syndrome. What what type of men? The men two A and two B are associated with pheo chromocytoma. Sir, what are the co- components of sir? men two A and two B? Sir, components of two A and two B. Sir, two uh, A is uh, characterized by. Uh, uh parathyroid hyperplasia and uh, medullary carcinoma of thyroid and pheochromocytoma sir uh, okay 2b is characterized by uh, medullary carcinoma of thyroid uh, pheochromocytoma there can be mucosal uh, neuroma sir and morphonoid habitus so morphonoid features sir. yeah any other conditions associated with uh, pheochromocytoma in younger population Up- sir multiple endo syndrome is also associated with it, sir what are the components of vhl so there can be multiple hemangioblastomas the brain cerebellar hemangioblastoma is very characteristic okay uh, then there can be renal cyst sir or multiple cyst renal cell carcinoma rcc or, yes sir or rcc the pancreatic mm. cyst or there can be neuroendocrine tumors like pheochromocytoma okay mm. anything else sir anything any other conditions you told men and uh, vhl neurofibromatosis also okay yes sir okay so uh, so if you have a younger patient we will be looking for this so we will do a calcium to exclude hyperparathyroidism so yes. and then uh, for a medullary carcinoma of thyroid if you are suspecting you do a calcitonin and all those things okay yes sir yeah yeah when primitive question nishant what are the five p's associated with pheochromocytoma yeah. what are the five p's associated with pheochromocytoma five p's ma'am five p's ma'am uh, that is uh, pain ma'am headache okay. then yes. uh, pressure that is hypertension there will be yes. palpitations there will yes. be uh, increased sweating ma'am uh, perspiration there will be perspiration What is the fifth one? Pallor. Yes. Yes. And can pheochromocytoma present with low BP as well? Yes, ma'am. It's a possibility, ma'am. 
this orthostatic hypotension can be a possibility am i right sir uh, yes yes absolutely they can present the orthostatic hypotension or unexplained lv dysfunction so we picked up few cases okay sir Dr. Tyagarajan, you want to add anything? Uh, no, sir. I think we covered most of it. Uh, and in this particular case, I think, uh, um, you know, because if it was not for the gastrointestinal <laughs> symptoms, uh, Nishant, yes, sir. Um, like how would you have proceeded with this patient? You know, that was the uh, the question, you know, I think Dr. Siddhi, sir, uh, you know, uh, touched upon. Uh, just wanted to ask you, you know, you, you went into the CT and then you went into the surgery. I, I'm asking, like, if the patient did not have the gastrointestinal symptoms, what would you have been your your approach to the towards this patient sir uh, then uh, uh, more towards cardiovascular and neurological uh, part along with the endocrinological will be the thing sir uh, i will definitely want to rule out uh, uh, cardiovascular issue with palpitation and uh, uh, i won't subject the patient for any look for any space occupying lesions or any malignancy as such of any breast or uh, uh, abdominal. Yeah. I'm just asking that, you know, the patient has uh, hypertension and, uh, um, uh, you know, uh, it was, you know, the, in the, on your physical exam, you mentioned that the blood pressure, still blood pressure was in the 170s yes. and patient was having headaches and palpitations. So, um, you know, if it was not for the FIO uh, staring at you with all these symptoms, and with the gastrointestinal symptoms, you know, what are the things, you know, which are more common than fear of proboscidoma? Uh, the hypertension with uh, these symptoms, uh, uh, we can ask you think of uh, primary hypertension leading to uh, you know, headache and uh, other manifestations, sir. Okay. And I think you did mention about, you know, hyperthyroidism. Yes, sir. Okay. And then, you know, what other things of like, say, um, secondary hypertension that you would think about, which are more, co again, more common than fear of uh, Sir, uh, mm, again, adrenal, uh, like, uh, pushings. Okay. Uh, uh, renal vascular hypertension, sir, renal pathology. Okay, primary aldosteronism. Uh, yes, sir. Pons syndrome. Nishant. Uh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, you have been asked about so many questions related to endocrine part of this uh, case. This yes. deviating from this uh, discussion. Just more interested to know about your ideas about or thoughts about a person who has come to you with hypertension. Yes. What are the basic examination you don't want to miss? Very, very basic question. Don't think extraordinarily. Think common and just come out with an answer. What are things you want to examine this patient? Even to you with the stem of, even to you as a hypertension patient. Please proceed with the examination. What are things you like to proceed with? Uh, sir, uh, mm, uh, starting from uh, general examination, uh, uh, look for any uh, um, um, uh, uh, vital space, any uh, pulse rate should be looked for, sir. any abnormal in the uh, volume of the pulse. So what way is going to be helpful in a patient with hypertension? Volume of the pulse? Sir, uh, if it's a large volume pulse and uh, BP with the variation in the upper and lower limbs can point out to valvular heart disease, sir. Hypertension patient, pure hypertension patient. I'm not talking about possibilities of wide pulse pressure, all those stuff. I'm telling you the patient is a hypertensive patient. That means it's an established hypertension patient. I want you to examine this patient. What are the things you're going to cover up? We'll start from head to foot. What are the things you like to think about? We had discussed about endocrine part of this hypertension-related examination findings. Yes. Right? 
I'm just asking you about non-endocrine. What other things will I have to examine this patient? So you're supposed in a hypertension patient given to you, you're supposed to examine the paleness first. Okay. So keeping in mind, the examination of mine in this patient would be targeting towards whether I'm able to confirm that hypertension is there or not. Already given to me is the hypertension. So there's no need for confirmation. But at the mm -hmm. same time, I need to look for either I'm able to identify any etiology of this patient's hypertension. Number two, I want to look for mainly end organ damage. Yes. So this is my main idea of examining this patient to start with. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to look for any evidence of starting from head to foot is my easy way of examining. I am going to see the patient paleness is maybe a cause as well as effect of this hypertension, which the patient might be seconded to chronic renal failure might be having. Edema legs could be representing a possibility of end organ damage, cardiac damage, or renal problem, which also to be looked for. Right? Pulse examination to be looked for, whether we're able to access all the pulses equally or not. You mentioned during the discussion also, polyarthritis, nodas, or hepatitis B, yes. coagulation of iota. So many things have been discussed. So I'd like to examine this patient pulse in all the four limbs that are able to access the pulse equally or not. And uh, the other important examination I'd like to proceed, I would like to examine the thyroid gland also. Yes. So often this is thyroid gland. And one more point I would like to examine the eyes is fundus examination. Never forget to see a patient fundus, irrespective of whatever the case is given to you. It's more applicable for hypertensive patients. Yes. Right? So examine the fundus of this patient. Moving down to the neck part, I would like to examine the carotid pulsations, equal or not. Any evidence of bruise is there or not? I would like to examine. As evidence of heart failure, we have to look for the jugular venous pressure. So what is my idea is to look for cause as well as effect of hypertension. So whenever you're given a scenario, always think about, for example, vomiting. What is the reason for vomiting? What is the effect of vomiting? We often miss some common symptoms. We try to miss the effect of what are the symptoms given to you as a clinical question. Yes. So always keep this idea in your mind. What are the problem? Be clear and quiet and approach the patient with the evidence of what is the reason for the problem, what is the effect of the problem. The problem here is given to you is hypertension, right? So yes. pre-cardial examination, I have to look for any evidence of lepidal hypertrophy as evidence of S3 or S4. Yes. So S3 in more in favor of hypertrophy of concentric. S4 is going to tell you that you might be dealing with systolic dysfunction. So I'm going to look for the effect as well as any evidence of cause for the hypertension also. Yes. So I'd like to proceed further. I will be more concentrating on the abdomen part, post-menopausal lady. I would like to examine the abdomen for what? Uh, abdomen for what? Sir, uh, so what is the background information about the family? So I'd like to examine the patient, any hypertensive patient, make it as a reflex phenomenon, examine the abdomen for renal Yes, sir. Bilateral renomegaly is there or not? The neurology is palpable or not? Followed by your examination of the examination of the Sir. renal artery bruit. Oh, yes. okay. so examine for because above the age of 40 years, you can get fibromuscular dysplasia, can present as or renal atherosclerosis above the age of 50 to 60 years, can present as two different etiology for renal artery bruit. We look for. So yes. renomegaly to be looked for, always should know how to examine the renomegaly. <laughs> then renal artery bruit also. Make an attempt to palpate for, auscultate for renal, renal artery bruit also. Yes. Okay. These are the few common examinations you're supposed to look for in a person with a hypertension. <laughs> the important yes. thing I would like to highlight here is thyroid examination as well as abdomen for renomegaly and renal artery examination. Yes. Not for that matter, any cardiac examination Never forget to examine, never forget to mention about thyroid examination. Yes, sir. I would say it's a part of your cardiac examination. Exam point of view also, it should be part of your cardiac examination, thyroid examination. Yes. Okay. Make this a habit to examine the patient. Okay. Okay. So what is the sign you call? It's out of the endocrine part. When you have a patient with a discrepancy of the pulsations, the upper and lower limb or upper and upper limb. 
what is the sign you call when you are able to get a bruise over the chest wall at the back hypertensive patient coin you have a discrepancy of pulsations right yes sir and you are able to get a bruise at the chest at the back what is the sign called as uh, able to follow my question the name of, i didn't get it sir, properly name of the sign yes sir of audibility of a bruise over the chest wall at the back in a person with pulsations discrepancy between the both upper limbs uh, sir uh... okay go and read about coectation iota what are the clinical signs you expect yes sir. right go and read about over to sindil and uh, tyagarajan and uh, bargavi please just one more thing nishan patrin this patient what yes. would, i know this patient had ct uh, what would be the imaging of choice for uh, someone with uh, pheochromocytoma this patient had that imaging actually i don't know you have not included that in the presentation but yes. what would be the imaging of choice uh sir screening wise not CT. screening imaging screening we have done we have diagnosed biochemically pheochromocytoma imaging radiological and sir a pet can be done sir no. anything more commonly used uh, more than pet can be done but more specifically mm. have you heard of uh, mibg scan yes sir mibg scintography can be done sir yeah i mean that's the imaging of that was the imaging of choice for fio but now there's one more imaging which this patient had i don't know whether you saw the images uh, this patient who had that scanning rather than mibg we didn't go for mibg because the latest one has more specificity the mm -hmm. so, somatostatin receptor In scan yes gallium 68 dotted yeah. scan dotted it pet ct hmm? yes sir. Uh, i think probably you didn't see the image as it really because with the patient yes, yes. i could get yeah. one the, image, so gallium 68 dotted it pet ct previously we used to do mibg regularly but uh, this gallium 68 dotted it has shown more specificity and picking up lesions intra uh, you know osseous lesions as well as uh, extra adrenal lesions more specifically so we go we have gone switched over to this rather than mibg nowadays yes yeah. and uh, this patient of course underwent an imaging but any protein role for uh, aldosterone or renin assays apart from these uh, check for um uh, for uh, this case it's not much of an uh, significant like uh, aldosterone levels uh, and uh, may ro play a role in adrenal insufficiency in... like we uh, talked about earlier uh, rishat uh, you know um, uh, uh, primary aldosteronism is much more common yes. than pheochromocytoma yes yes so a renin aldo ratio uh, can be done yes any more questions sir um, so from my end i think it's uh, we've covered almost everything uh, if there is no further questions can we ask we can ask the faculties to just give a final input to the presenter regarding his presentation and yeah. uh, the way yeah. to improve his presentation skill as well yeah uh nishant I, i think uh, i mean overall you did a good job uh, Very glad about it, but a few things it could. Uh, so when you're taking history, try to be more uh, specific pertaining to the symptoms, the symptom analysis. And yes. one thing uh, where you can improve is the differential diagnosis. 
uh, I think your differential diagnosis is not correlating with the his, history summary of the history or the clinical findings, except one or two. I know you have seen this patient and taken the history, but keep an open mind and, and think about what are the differential diagnosis you can naturally think of rather than just go by the specialty or by the case diagnosis. Uh, and then very few important things like, you know, the fundus examination in a patient with hypertension. So all those things shouldn't be missed. But overall, it was a good presentation. Try to read more about it. Read about uh, the role of uric acid uh, in SAADH. There is, uh, it's one of the recent advances. I think we are doing more and more of it. So read about it. That's your point. Yes. And yes. one more thing, Nishant, I think uh, mm -hmm. you had mentioned the differentials at the end of history as well as at the end of examination. Yes, so I think at the end of your initial investigations, uh, you had not incorporated a DD again because usually at the end of preliminary investigations, even when we admit patients in the ward, at the end of preliminary investigations, we revise our diagnosis, right? In yes, both the cases, I think you must to insert that slide. Okay, ma'am. I link to the next step. Nishant, uh, yeah, I think again uh, you did a, um, um, a great job of presenting both the cases, and um, uh, you know just uh, um, you know going with the, uh, a flow of uh, the history and the physical exam, and then after that you know coming into the investigations part, and then you know narrowing down your differential diagnosis. That's what you know you may be um, a little bit uh, lacking over there. <laughs> so if you could uh, uh, you know improve on that, that would be great. Yes. Uh, and then uh, after making the, the diagnosis also, the, the etiology of the diagnosis is also something you should uh, uh, you come up with uh, when, you, when you are presenting the case. Like say, for example, you are saying hypopituitarism, uh, you have to say what, what, is, what was the etiology of hypopituitarism and you can uh, you know, um, say what kind of test would you, you would be doing towards that also. Same with this pheochromocytoma as well. And uh, I think Dr. Sindhis had explained and uh, mentioned about, you know, uh, the, the associated symptom and associated conditions like the MENs and the uh, the VHLs and neurofibromas and such. Yes. And on a lighter vein, I think Nishant, all of us have switched on our videos. I don't know why you have not switched on your video. In the examination, mm -hmm. ultimately, you have to present yourselves as well. Uh, thank you. Yes, Nishant. Yes, okay, so finally, I think if there are no comments, shall we yeah. use the session? Yeah, sure. Yeah. Yeah, I really yes, thank yes. all the faculties for this wonderful discussion and appreciate Sinshant for a wonderful presentation. But the areas where it's been highlighted by the faculties, you need to improve on it. Probably next presentation, you should have a better way of presentation, especially at the differential levels, yes. and as well as the especially the order of differentials, as well as each and every stage of your uh, presentation. You should have a revision of your differentials and narrow down probably at the end of the final level of your examination followed by your investigations. You should be in a better way of uh, coming to the uh, best yes. conclusion out of the <clears throat> and the problems list which you're having in your hand. Okay. Yes. I think this, uh, this platform is basically meant for to improve your qualities of presentation. Try to utilize this presentation call, uh, platform. Okay. Yes. yes. Thank you. Thank you all of you and uh, good night all of you. Thank, thank you, you, thank you, man. Thank Good you. night. Thank you, man. Thank you. Good night. Good night.